Good evening. Thank you for coming. I, I know all of you, but I'm Dom. I'll just have to post the video. So I gave a talk a couple of weeks ago at the conference on everything, but I'm going to make this talk more general about contactless smart cards so that it's more accessible, interesting. And then I'll go into some of the technical details of what I'm working on towards the end. So I just want to start off with some motivation. Uh, if we just think about how we identify ourselves with the cards that we carry around, especially with payment systems, this is someone who has like an RFID chip implanted into their uh, skin. And so nowadays, where how we usually identify ourselves is you know, through all of these types of devices. We have passports, which actually have an RFID tag built into them so that if you go through like a checkpoint, they can maybe see who you are or they, they scan them at the, uh, you know, at the airport or whatnot. And then we have all these cards which give away certain information about us and help us to identify ourselves to certain locations, whether that's a payment system, whether it's opening a door. And so this isn't quite where we're at right now, but this point, isn't too far away. It's just a matter of we carry these devices and cards with us rather than having them implanted within us. But this, the purpose is the same. It's still for identification. So I just want to start off with that. Um, so if we're looking at contactless smart cards in particular, there's a few ways that you can be compromised or attack vectors, as they're usually called in the security literature. Um, the first is someone can steal your card. And if you're vigilant, you can make sure that you can prevent against that type of attack. The other is someone can hold up a rogue reader to your wallet, purse, bag, whatever you have with you, and then they can get some information off of your card. And they could do that without you knowing about it. And so that's another attack vector. Another one is using a malicious reader. So whenever we hold our cards up to a reader, we don't know if that reader is getting extra information to our uh, viewpoint normally. It's just opening a door or allowing us to pay for something. But in reality, it could be, have been tampered with and could be collecting some other information or doing some other transactions. So with those three attack vectors, what can actually happen? The, or what attacks can be carried out? First thing is they could just gather information. So with a normal contactless smart card uh, transaction, you have to exchange data. And ideally that data is gonna be encrypted, but when the first communication happens, it can't be because the encryption channel hasn't been set up. So the first thing that can be done, even if someone's just sniffing the transaction, just listening to the radio waves that are being passed back and forth, they can gather some information on what's, um, uh, you know, on your contact with smart card and potentially even get some identity information on you based on that smart card. Um, the other one is cloning. So if someone steals your smart card, um, they could potentially then take it back to a lab. They can do some, maybe some tampering here, take out the chip and then read the memory contents off the chip and then clone your card and create a replica of it. And then if they're if they have stolen your card, they can even create a clone of your original card, give that clone back to you, and you never even know that it was stolen in the first place. Yet they still have your own card. They could use it for transactions. And so that's one way of cloning. If they actually steal your card and physically take it apart, use some laser or uh, chemicals to etch out the chip and uh, actually read the memory contents. The other one is just through cryptographic means. And this was done in, uh, 2007, 2008 by some researchers because we all know that the London Underground uses the contactless cards. And so what these people were doing was they were taking that same model of card and they, were, they found a way that the cryptography in those cards was weak so they could replicate those cards and get you know, free rides on the, on the subway. And uh, so that was a big vulnerability that happened in, that, uh, you know, in this 2008 era. And that only required you to uh, just have like a rogue reader and sniff a few transactions. You didn't even have to take apart and do all of this um, tampering that uh, you'd have to do if you stole a card. So that's another type of attacking, uh, attack against the contactless smart card. 
Now, the one that I'm looking at in particular is the relay attack, where you don't actually create a clone of a card, and you don't actually need to save any of the details that you read off of a card. You're just acting as a relay channel in between the valid card and a valid reader. So if we look at a normal transaction or a valid transaction, you have your normal card or tag, as they're called if we're talking about RFID technology and RFID radio frequency ID, just basically anything that is contactless. So um, a normal transaction, you're just talking to a reader one way. You know, you go to pay for something, you know, this is the card terminal and your payment is accepted or you go to open a door, this is the door terminal and your, the door opens. But in a relayed transaction, you have these uh, proxy reader and a proxy tag, which are used by the attacker. And those can send the signal from the valid tag over to a valid re reader that could be on the other side of the world. And the tr valid reader thinks that this transaction was taken or had taken place with the valid tag, when in reality, it could have been transferred through these proxy readers or this proxy reader and tag across a relay and this relay could be uh, wireless it could be wired it could be implemented on a simple uh, smartphone because nowadays smartphones have nfc readers built into them so you can just download an app on two phones and send the signal over uh, an internet connection to the other phone and so this has really become a problem with keys and some of you may have seen this video or I showed the picture of this, but this time I'll actually show the video. Um, so the, this is with a car key. So these attackers are trying to steal, oh, sorry, the video's not on that screen. Let me pull it over. Okay. Okay, so these attackers pull up and their goal is to steal this car. And so this car is unlocked using a wireless key. So what they do is one of them acts as the proxy tag and one of them acts as the, or sorry, he's acting as a proxy reader, he's acting as a proxy tag. So the key is somewhere in this house and he is holding up a reader and then relaying the message back to his uh, accomplice who then opens the car. And right now they think they're done and they start walking away, but I think what happens is they realize that they haven't yet started the car. And so he goes back and he's gonna perform the relay attack again. So he's again gonna take this key, which is, taking, which is communicating with the car over this relay channel in the middle. And so now they're gonna start the car and they're gonna drive away. And the cars don't usually turn off in this case because uh, it's a safety concern if you're driving on like a, you know, a highway or something and your car stops. So you can steal cars this way and it's been done. This was just from, I think, early this fall, earlier this fall. And so that's uh, one of the more important attacks because when that happens, you can lose you know, 50,000 pounds or however much your car's worth. And that's all because of the uh, bad security systems implemented by the uh, keys. And it, basically they don't have a distance bounding protocol. In, in theory, if the key was left in a place where it couldn't be, uh, Re, uh, relayed with via this relay attack, then you wouldn't be vulnerable to it. But it just happened that the key was, you know, at this point in the house, and then they could just easily send the signal to the car. So you could defend against it, but ideally you'd want what's called a distance bounding protocol. So um, if we think about the signal that's going between, so if we, in this transaction, there's the what's called the uh, proximity coupling device, basically the reader, PCD, that's gonna send out a bit to the card and then the card has to respond. And you can use the time that the card takes to respond to calculate how far away the card is simply by the speed of light, essentially. So if you think about the reader will send out its last bit or the PCD, and then it'll take a certain amount of time over the air, just based on the speed of light to get to the uh, contactless smart card, or PIC, as they're normally called, uh, proximity integrated circuit card. And that's just the word that makes it a little easier to think about. But um, so the PIC receives that last byte, 
it waits a delay time, and then it sends out its response to the reader. And so you can use that amount of time that occurs between the reader sending out its last byte, or its last bit, and the card receiving, or sorry, the card then sending out its bit and, and the reader receiving the response as this time that can be used for distance bounding. So I'll get into some of the specifics now of how the uh, smart cards actually work. Essentially, there's this ISO standard um, which governs how the communication works. And these are common in computer science um, and different engineering fields. But they go everything down from the physical characteristics of where the wire should be placed, a recommendation for placing the wires, all the way up to the transmission protocols, so like how the bits and bytes are represented and sent and um, all those details. And this standard is used for cards, which are called proximity cards, which function at maybe 10 centimeters, 20 centimeters, and within that range. There's also other ISO standards for cards that go at longer distances, maybe up to two meters, used for like ski passes or something like that. Um, but this standard specifically looks at short distances, proximity cards as they're called. And so these are passive devices, contactless cards, and so they're powered up from the reader with a 13.56 megahertz carrier. And that carrier uh, uses inductive coupling to essentially, it's like a transformer, and the power is transferred from the reader to the card and then the card then uses that carrier's clock to performance calculations and then respond. And like I said, a PCD is normally known as a reader uh, and a PIC is known as a card. And those are just the words that are used in that ISO standard, so they've become widely used. And so I'm going to use those throughout the rest of the presentation pretty much. So the communication which actually takes place, for, so this is actually a trace from a reader talking to a card. And it looks a little bit crazy, but I'll explain what's going on. Essentially, when the, uh, oh, sorry, these are backwards. This should be PCD to pick, but this is the reader sending out the request. So what it does is it has this 13.56 megahertz carrier, and then it turns it on and off. And depending on for how long it turns it on, well, depending on how often it turns it on and off, that's how it sends ones and zeros. And it um, does this, what is, and it sends the bits using what is known as modified Miller encoding. And it's not super important what that means, but after a certain amount of time, the PCD or the, or sorry, the PIC or the card then responds. And it sends its ones and zeros just by turning on or off a load resistor in its internal circuitry. So there's normally this carrier that's getting sent from the reader to the card and the carrier frequency has a certain strength and by turning on, on, on and off this load resistor in the card it changes that strength and it's not very much of a change you can see here it's just uh, you know it's not like this 100 percent change here but it's enough that the reader can then receive the information and decode it and that uses manchester encoding so here's a, an example passed through a spectrum analyzer, which essentially just takes away all the, um, the carrier frequency and just makes, it makes it a lot easier to see. And you could see here that this is the reader sending out the request. This is the first request in the whole transaction for any one of these cards. And so it turns on and off this carrier, and then the card responds using the uh, load modulation that we, that we talked about. And this is an example of actually sending bits. So the bit length is based on an amount of time, based on the number of carrier clock cycles. So uh, I don't want to get too in depth about how the um, actual bits are represented. But essentially, this is like one bit length, and this is another bit length. So even though you see those. Uh, square wave turning on and off, that's not necessarily a bit length. Usually it's half a square wave on, half a square wave off is a bit, and um, that's, that's how the actual um, information is then received and decoded by the reader. So one of the things you can do 
is make precise timing measurements of the transactions because like I said in this previous diagram, um, the amount of time that this transaction takes is vital for seeing how far away a card is because the speed of light is three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. So if you're even off by a few nanoseconds, you could potentially have a few kilometers of distance that an attack could then be relayed from. And when we're talking about that car video and a kilometer, if, if you don't have that precise timing measurement, you lose the game because uh, you can then relay the attack and circumvent the distance running protocol. So one of the first things I did for my project was I took this open source reader, which is called the Proxmark 3, and this can be used with certain smart cards that are currently out in the market. Um, the two that I looked at were the MyFair Plus and MyFair Deskfire, which are made by NXP Semiconductors, a Dutch company. And this has a lot of, uh, it's completely open source circuitry, so it has a, the schematics are entirely available. It uses a Spartan 2 field programmable gate array, which um, ha has all the code available for, and then it uses an ARM microcontroller. And this is just a block diagram of essentially how that tool works. You have the antenna, which actually communicates with the card, and then you have the, um, your PC is where you actually send all the commands out from. This talks to an operating system on the Proxmark, and then the Proxmark then sends out the signals on this uh, transmit path, and it receives signals on the uh, receive path, and it passes all of its received signals into an analog digital converter, which then gets processed by the uh, FPGA and sent back to the operating system, and eventually the PC client. So the distance bounding protocol is where the precise timing measurements are actually important. So in this middle part here, that's where we're actually going to be, the reader on the left here is actually sending out the commands to the card, and then it's timing how fast the card responds. So this bit here is the important part where we're actually making those precise timing measurements. And this is actually how the protocol is implemented on the MyFair Plus and MyFair Dust Fires. So the cards advertised that they will respond in um, 1,696 microseconds. And then I did some tests and found that the measurements were a, a little bit off uh, compared to that time, but they were uh, they had low variance. So you can actually just adjust the reader's um, time as long as the time which the card takes to respond is constant or uh, has a low variance, then that's still a good implementation. So I also did some uh, work with overclocking because if you overclock and you make a card respond quicker, then you can make it uh, you could potentially perform a relay attack and gain a little bit extra distance. So normally, the communication takes a certain amount of time. And then if you implement the relay attack, you're going to have to add some extra time to actually perform the relay. But if you overclock, then you could perform the, you know, see the amount of time the card takes to respond will be quicker. And then you could uh, still perform a relay attack and still be within that time bound. And so this is the Proxmark 3 analog receive path. And when it, it receives this input signal of a card communication getting sent back, and then it has a peak detector which outputs a signal essentially like this. And, it's, and it still has in it, this signal, the 13.56 megahertz carrier. And so once you uh, do the analog digital conversion, you do it at the same frequency as the carrier. So then in the blue there, we've gotten rid of that carrier just by passing it through the analog digital converter. And then there's some digital filtering, which is done in the FPGA code, which um, sets up the signal to be peak detected, which is then how the reader, the Proxmark 3, notices the ones and zeros. So using this overclocking method, the FPGA had to be adjusted for this edge detection, but the MyFair Plus has been clocked up to 16.57 uh, megahertz, 
and the dust fire up to 16.23, and they're only supposed to work at 13.56, so this is bad um, for conducting relay attacks. And the MyFair Classic doesn't have a distance bounding protocol, but that got all the way up to 19.23 megahertz. So ideally, this would be fixed by implementing a sort of phase-locked loop in the smart card, and that could then adjust the frequency down to 13.56 megahertz so that it doesn't respond as quick to the distance bounding protocol. So that's all I have. Hopefully I didn't get too in-depth. Maybe I did, but if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Thanks. <laughs>